Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the privilege, the wonderful, marvelous privilege that you've given us to gather together to feast on your word. We are so keenly aware of our limitations of just how little we know, but we do know that we are taught by you. May the Holy Spirit just take this time, take charge, filtering out all the ignorance and the foolishness, but opening our hearts, our minds to the truth of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've been studying together in the uh, first uh, epistle to the Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, uh, we had reached verse 11 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 11. We are looking at the Holy Spirit as being our teacher. Uh, even the first verse, if you remember, of chapter 2, it began with, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. In uh, verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Uh, verse 10, But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, so I think that in the near context, the us there are the apostles. And then by extension, uh, that through the apostles, it is also revealed to us. But the near context is the apostles. I see this as a strong testimony to the inspiration of the Word of God. That this book is God-breathed. God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. It's by means of His Spirit. Uh, for the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And that's pretty much where we left off uh, in the last video. Verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man, which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, I think the, the obvious meaning uh, there, uh, the obvious meaning is, is, uh, is we all see the obvious meaning. Uh, and that is, is that the only possible way that a man can know what he's thinking is the Spirit that's in him. I can't know what you're thinking. You can't know what I'm thinking. Uh, you don't know what I think. I don't know what you think. The only person or, or spirit that knows what's in your mind is your spirit. And uh, nobody else knows all of that. It is in the same way, you'll notice the, the spirit of man, which is in him, in him, uh, take note of the fact, you'll notice that there's no in him when it comes to God. You know, uh, even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Uh, we know that the Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit, the author of this epistle. It's not Paul. Paul merely held the pen. Uh, the Spirit of God is God. Uh, but that's not true in man. You know, God breathed life into man. He breathed in man the breath of life, and that breath of life is the Spirit. So like Adam, uh, so man has a spirit in him placed there by God. And you have the Holy Spirit placed in you by God. Uh, very interesting uh, concept there. Whereas nobody breathed the life-giving spirit into God. That's my point. God doesn't have a spirit in him. He is spirit. And he knows his mind. He knows his mind. The spirit and the mind 
of God, I believe, are synonyms. And God knows uh, exactly what he intends to do. And no man can know that but God's Spirit. Yet God has revealed this unto us. Okay, and, and once again, I'm, I'm confronted with the word us there in the text. I believe God revealed it to the apostles and, and, uh, and the apostles and their writings have revealed it to us. But the near context is the apostles, so we go on with that. Then in verse 12, now we have, and that's, that's an indicative mood of, an, of certainty, we have definitely uh, received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And again, I believe the emphasis here is on the fact that the Holy Spirit uh, has, through the agency of God, inspired the apostles to give us his word. And since we have his word, we also have these things freely given to us by God. What are these things freely given to us by God? I believe he's freely given uh, the things that he's freely given us. Uh, which are of God, is the Word, His Word. You know, the question here is, if that's true, then why are there so many people who profess to be Christians who know so little of the Scriptures, who are so in the dark as it concerns who they are in Christ? Uh, you know, it, it amazes me how that uh, people who have been going to church for years and years and years uh, and uh, profess to know the Lord, they, they need to use the index in their Bible to find a book of the Bible, let alone a chapter or a verse. And, uh, you know, if these things uh, uh, are freely given to us, then how do we explain that? Well, I've said it before. I believe that everything God wants you to know he is in this book. Everything God wants you to know, He freely gave to you and you hold it in your hand. I mean, I don't see how that we can reach any other conclusion. This is all inclusive. It includes every Christian, every believer, every child of God. God has freely given us His Word. And I believe he gave us his word through the apostles. And this is a strong testimony here, I believe, to the scriptures being God breathed, the, the, uh, the inspiration, uh, infallibility of God's word. Uh, I believe the word of God is infallible, absolutely reliable, absolutely trustworthy, and without error. And then it doesn't matter which translations you have, which translation you have, or which translation that you use. There's so much argument uh, along those those lines. You know, you got the King James version only people, and so on and so forth. I hope you use all the translations. Okay, it's not a matter of translation, but that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. I believe He can teach you no matter through what whatever translation that you happen to have. You know, we spend a lot of time going over these verses. And by the time we get through with the verse, it doesn't look like what the King James Version said much of the time. And, and folks, you have the immense responsibility to say, you know, I think Steve's reading more into that than, than what's really there. You know, or I think he's making an application out of that that he really shouldn't make. The truth is, it's God's Word. And without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to know it anyway. And it's interesting that this whole subject comes up after everything else that we've seen. And it stands in between something that we're fixing to look at in the future. Uh, nobody can know the truth of the Word of God separate from the Holy Spirit. Not one single person who is not enlightened by the Holy Spirit can read this book and know what God is, is, is saying. Uh, 
just stop to th and think for a moment. God used Paul to write this epistle. Paul did not author it. God patiently trained Paul for over 50 years before he ever wrote this epistle. Uh, that's, that's an interesting subject in, in all, just in and of itself. But that tells me that if God had given that task to me, well, you'd probably be reading the epistle in a southern dialect. Like, you know, like, uh, you know, y'all have received not the spirit of, of the world. You know, now, now, that's just trying to beg a point. What God did is, from birth, before birth, ordained and trained each one of the men that he chose to write his word. So, uh, any characteristics of Paul that you see, God put them there. You know, it isn't that... I don't think that it, it's like that. It's not that God sat back and He said, uh, "Okay, now Paul, here's what I want you to say. Put it in your own words." I don't believe that for a moment. Uh, what He said is, "Paul, I've trained you for you know fifty some odd years, and I put you through all of these experiences that you've gone through." Um, all these trials, all these tribulations, all these hardships. And, and all of that training is a Pharisee of the Pharisees. In order that you write this truth and whatever characteristics Paul used, whatever, uh, whatever expressions that he, he might have chosen that are uh, unique to Paul, God ordained those. He built them into Paul's experience over the years. So, uh, Paul was a, a fit instrument in, in God's hands. He was a fit tool to write what God authored. And he did that. The apostles received aorist indicative. That, that is, they really received not the spirit of the world, not this fallen spirit, but the spirit which is from God. And there was a purpose in that. It was in order that we may know, and that's a perfect tense, that we may perfectly know the things that are freely given to us of God. You know, I don't think that we can just sit down and fill in the blanks and let our imagination run wild and write down all these things that we think that we've been freely given by God. I think it's speaking of the truth of God's word. And the only way that you know what is in this book, you don't know it from what I say. You don't know it from what someone else says. You know it from what's written in this book. And you have a responsibility to search the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. And, it's, uh, and so it's those things that we speak. And our act of speaking is not words of men's wisdom. Uh, we don't go outside what is written. Uh, the, the teaching that comes from that. But the teaching that comes from the Holy Spirit, you know, if the Holy Spirit doesn't teach you, then you can't know what this book says. And if, he's t if he is teaching you, he seals truth and only truth to the hearts of his people. You know, those who hear, those that the Holy Spirit teaches. Uh, I don't teach. I, no, I do. I, I'm a teacher. I, I teach, but... It's not really me. I don't really teach. Whatever I teach has to be seasoned really with a huge amount of ignorance and a tiny bit of intellectual experience and a and, and certain degree of truth. And the Holy Spirit filters what I speak. Okay? Uh, when we are speaking the Word of God, we're speaking so that the Holy Spirit teaches. Uh it's only the act of speaking here that we're looking at. That's what the word is. 
That's what it means. We're not talking about the, uh, uh, the content of, of what is said. Uh, the, uh, that's, that's a marvelous truth. I don't, I don't know really how to, uh, to, to put it into words. Uh, it's not about excellency of speech or of wisdom. I think maybe perhaps Paul had a speech defect from gotten hit in the, in, the, in the face with a stone or something. That's just my own personal belief. He's, uh, it, it, but if you're tuning in, folks, just to listen to me, you know that, that I think that's a waste of time. And I think our text kind of talks against that. I can't say anything to anybody who is not God's elect, that makes a lick of sense, okay? But if you are God's child, then it'll be the Holy Spirit who teaches you, not me. Therefore, it really doesn't matter who, you know, who is teaching the word. I hear it every day. Uh, well, uh, you know this guy's uh, good, or, you know, he, he really teaches good. I'm going to go hear him. No, uh you know, he's the best Bible teacher on the Folks, nobody's good. The only good Bible teacher is the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul is, is telling us here, you know, remember, I was with you. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of man's wisdom. You know, I mean, who wants to hear that guy? Uh, think about that next time you hear someone that's not very eloquent you know listen to what they're saying i don't want to entice folks to come here and listen to me as if i'm some authority on what these verses say folks you know that i'm i, I i'm not that you know i'm not that uh i knew a brother who pastored a church of of four members for years and, and I don't see where numbers has anything to do with it. What's important is this book. Yes, Paul was inspired. Uh, yes, the other writers of, 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 of these books uh, were inspired. They were trained. They were used of God to give us his word. But what does that mean? It means that we have God's word. Not only that, we have his spirit, okay, and we have his mind. We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We not only have the word of God, but we have the Holy Spirit who teaches it. Dearly beloved, all I do is speak, and the Holy Spirit filters out the nonsense, and he seals truth to your heart only the holy spirit teaches truth you know talking is just talking you know uh, in the greek text here the word is the act of speaking it's there's no content involved okay the act of speaking is that which the holy spirit teaches so you know i can talk and uh, sometimes i love to talk sometimes i don't but I can talk and I can have absolute confidence that in all of my stumbling around and in my lack of understanding, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, will teach truth to whom he wants to teach spiritual truth. And, and in fact, truth that maybe I didn't even grasp, you know, uh, in my experience as a Bible uh, teacher, uh, over the years you know I can count the number of times I've I've labored I would I would labor over a passage of scripture only for someone to make some comment that shined light on it where that I'm like well, why didn't I see that uh, I read I read uh, most of your comments you know and, and some have talked said about you know talked about how much these videos have helped them these verse by verse but listen uh, uh, I don't think that most ministers realize just how smart that their congregations are 
You know, I'm thrilled that the Holy Spirit is doing the teaching. If I'm doing the teaching, okay, number one, it won't be right. And number two, it won't be logical. You know, and number three, it won't be consistent. But with the Holy Spirit, it will be. It will be. Uh, it is He who's doing the teaching. And, and what is He doing? Well, our text says that He's comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 13. That's what He's doing. And uh, now, so now you Greek students out there, you can go, you can translate your heads off. Uh, he could be, he could be explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. The word comparing there can, can be rightly translated explaining. Uh, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. Or, Explaining spiritual things with spiritual truth. Uh, though I think he does both. I'm going to say that in our text here, I'm going to say that, that, that he's explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. I think that is, uh, that is what the Holy Spirit is doing in this verse. And dearly beloved, that is an extremely important thing. The only people where this is being engaged in uh, as an activity is with spiritual people. Spiritual people. We're going to get into chapter 3 and we're going to see who's spiritual, all right, and who's not. Uh, God's people are spiritual people. If you're God's people, person you're a spiritual person God's people because God's people are spiritual okay and too many churches seem to believe you know that if we do it right you know we, you know we can make ungodly people God's people we can you know turn goats into sheep and that sort of thing when when God the truth is of the fact is that God's people have been God's people from before the foundation of, of the world they're his people and then in many cases, they may not know it. You know, Paul didn't for a time. I don't believe that he realized he was one of God's people until on the road to Damascus. But that does not change the fact that he was separated from his mother's womb. Uh, what I believe, what, what the Holy Spirit, I believe, is doing I, is, well, the, the Greek literally reads... Uh, taught of the Spirit by spiritual means, spiritual things communicating. That's that's if you re read that, you know, in direct from the direct manuscript, the Greek manuscript. Therefore, those who are not spiritual cannot comprehend spiritual truth. Look at what it says: the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. Of the Spirit of the God. Uh, verse 14. What a strong verse. The contrast being drawn there is between the natural man versus the spiritual man. And I believe that is going to be very, very important when we cross over from chapter 2 to chapter 3. You know, because, you know, in Bible college, they try to teach me that Christians are divided into two classes of people, you know, basically, you know, the good ones and the bad ones, you know, the, the, there's those that are carnal, those who are spiritual. And I'm talking about Christians here. We're not talking about non-Christians. I'm talking about some Christians are, 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 are not spiritual, uh, you know, that. That, and that babes in Christ are not really spiritual because they're fleshly and carnal. And when the text clearly states that they are spiritual, you're going to find out that the babe in Christ is just as spiritual as the, the mature believer in Christ. Yet they're, they're acting as though they're not. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the truth of it. Uh, but apparently... Uh, God, through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, apparently he made some good Christians and he made some bad ones. And, and folks, I can't do that. I just, I can't do that. I do not think, 
for one second that that's what it says. I think that what we're going to see, what we're going to find out, what we're going to learn is, is that these beloved Corinthians were not acting as though they were spiritual when in fact they were. And, and they were spiritual. Why? Why were they spiritual? Because they were God's children. I've said this a number of times. I'll say it again. I think the Lord Jesus Christ did every bit as much for you as he did for Paul. I think he loves you every bit as much as he loved Paul, you know, or Peter or John or the Corinthians. You know, that, that he didn't love the Ephesians more than he loved the Corinthians. Okay? He loves you. And he showed that love by dying in your place. So I, I, I don't think there's any more God is going to do for the babe in Christ as far as redemption is concerned. The babe in Christ is spiritual. The natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit for they are spiritually discerned. Yeah, the baby in Christ is spiritual, but they may not be living as who they are. But when it comes to the natural man, he has no chance whatsoever of even hearing the word of God. He receives not the things of the spirit of God. So it's the Holy Spirit who's doing the teaching and the, and the fleshly man, the natural man, the man who is not one of God's children cannot receive those things. Uh, we've freely been given these things. To, to the natural man, they're foolish. They're just foolishness. Uh, and the next phrase is very powerful. Neither can he know them. He has no power. He has no ability. He has no potential of any kind, nothing in him to assist him in understanding these things. Uh, he absolutely cannot know them. Why? Because they are only discerned by the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And uh, clearly in the context, uh, the Holy Spirit is not teaching those who are not His. And, and now, you know, someone says, uh, yeah, well, you know, that's not fair. You know, God's not fair. He's not being fair. Well, you tell him that. Okay, I, I'm, I won't. I'm, I'm not going to argue with him. And as I've mentioned on uh, more than one occasion, you know, Christians will zealously defend their right to choose. Why should you have a right to choose and God not? These who are born after the flesh, these are not the children of God. And, and folks, doesn't God, doesn't he have the right to have his own family? But those who are not of his family are not taught. The reason he can't know them is he doesn't have any ability to know them. You know, you can preach to them until you're blue in the face. They can't know. Why? Because they don't have the Spirit of God. And the things that we are talking about uh, in this context are the things of the Spirit of God. He that is spiritual, that is, that's the guy that belongs to God or the gal that belongs to God. And he that is spiritual judges all things. This man who, uh, who is only a natural man only judges natural things. Okay, the spiritual man can judge both the natural and the spiritual. And yet he himself, listen, look at what the text says, he himself is judged of no man. There is therefore no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ. No condemnation. Romans 8.1 A marvelous truth. 
uh, you know, why is it that 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 too many Christians seem to think that there's some impending terror hanging over their heads because of, of sin or unconfessed sin or whatever. Dearly beloved, there is no judgment for those of you who are in Christ. None. And, and you're not unjudgeable because of anything that you did. But by the blood of His cross. It was through the blood of His cross that He presented you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. This is how every single one of these Corinthians stood before God. Please understand that. Please, dearly beloved. Uh, the love of God is seen in the sovereignty of God. He loved us so much, He died in our place. For who has known the mind of the Lord that He may instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. As new creations in Christ Jesus, we have the mind of Christ. If you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, you have the mind of Christ. Now, what is the mind of Christ? If it isn't that He loves us with an everlasting love, that He gave Himself in our place, that He'll never leave us nor forsake us, that He holds us in the hollow of His hand, that He directs our steps, that He knows the paths that we take, that He bottles our tears. What more, folks, could we ask? We have the mind of Christ. When we cross over into chapter 3, I think... I think we're going to, and, and I hope you do, I, I hope you, you are just beside yourself with excitement over how God, the Holy Spirit, addresses these believers at Corinth. Um, I've often stated, and, and, I, and I, I truly do believe this, theological error precedes moral error error whatever you 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 can say about whatever we can say about the corinthians in all of their i don't know what 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 word should i use all of their ungodliness their filthiness the of the flesh for whatever you can say about them i am absolutely if i know anything i'm absolutely positive that the holy spirit is well aware was and is well aware of the fact that these beloved Christians at Corinth, they were his people, that they had an old man that could do nothing but sin, but they were all made new creations in Christ Jesus. I'm not talking about the natural man who cannot hear the things of the Spirit. I'm talking about God's people, that sin was no longer the issue, Sin was no longer the question. That whole issue of sin had been settled at the cross, as we see, as we saw, as when we went through the epistle to the Colossians. All of our transgressions, dearly beloved, do you not know? If you don't know, if you do not know, that you stand before God holy, without spot, without blemish, I pray that, that you do. One of my burdens, I guess, perhaps maybe the biggest burden that I've carried for more than 30 years as a believer and, and as a Bible teacher and a pastor, my, my greatest burden has been that God for God's people would, would come to realize who they are in Christ. That's a life changer, folks. It is truly a life changer. Look, I love you all. I truly do. And I appreciate all of your comments, your support. 
Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.